All right, thanks for watching. And from the producer of f of x plus y equals f of x times f of y comes a cool new formula. Let's find all the functions which are additive, namely f of x plus y equals f of x plus f of y. And um, I will do it in several different cases. So I'll do something very specific and then I'll give you the general case. So first of all, let's assume f is differentiable. Okay, then, well, y can be anything, so let's call it h. So f of x plus h equals f of x plus f of h. Let's pull the le f of x on the left-hand side, so f of x plus h minus f of x over, uh, sorry, uh, equals f of h. of h and then uh, divide by h all right so um, that's not quite interesting yet almost uh, don't worry we'll let h go to zero but one little thing though notice if you let y equals zero you have f of x plus zero equals f of x plus f of zero okay. now this means f of x equals f of x plus f of zero, cancel this out, and you get, no matter what f is, we must have f of zero equals f of equals zero. So what this is, it's really f of h minus f of zero over h, and now take the limit. Okay. So take the limit as h goes to zero of this, and the limit as h goes to 0 of this. What is that? That is f prime of x. And what is this? This is f prime of 0. Assume it exists. And let's call this a constant. So what we get? f prime of x equals to a constant. And so f of x equals to basically a linear function, cx plus c prime. But look, if you plug in x equals 0 here, so for x equals 0, you get f of 0 equals c0 plus c prime, and that's just c prime. But we know f of 0 equals 0, so we get c prime equals 0, which means f of x must be linear in this sense. And in fact, you can check that if f is linear, then f of x plus y is uh, f of x plus f of y. So if f is differentiable, yeah, that works. And in fact, notice all we really need is differentiability at zero. So if this limit exists, automatically that limit exists, and we are done. That was like one level, right, of being specific. Now, so that was like if you want the uh, calculus level, now let's go to the analysis level. What if f is just continuous? And so in particular, this argument is invalid because we don't know if f prime exists. Turns out we still reach the same conclusion. Because, look, suppose f of x plus y equals f of x plus f of y. It's still true, again, that f of 0 equals 0, but now let y be x. So f of x plus x equals f of x plus f of x. So in other words, f of 2x equals 2f of x. So in some sense, you know, f of 2x is 2f of x, and you can just continue, and you find f of 3x is 3f of x, f of 4x is 4f of x. So at least for positive integers, f of mx is mf of x. That's one thing. And moreover, we have the following nice result. Take... Now, y is minus x, so f of x minus x 
equals f of x plus f of minus x. Now, f of x minus x, this is f of 0, but we know that is 0, right, by what we've shown here. So f of x plus f of minus x is 0. So indeed, what's interesting is f is odd. f of minus x is minus f of x. And what this tells us is, this works for positive integers, but it also works for negative integers. Because suppose negative m is an integer, then f of minus mx becomes now minus f of mx, and this is minus m f of x. So it also holds for negative integers. That's great. And lastly, I'm claiming this linearity property also holds for fractions. I have to remind myself why this is true. Yeah, now I remember. Because um, you see, we know f of x plus y is f of x plus f of y. Then what we get... Let me remember. Yeah, so let's do y is, basically replace x with x over 2 and y with x over 2. Then f of x over 2 plus x over 2 is f of x over 2 plus f of x over 2. So f of x equals 2 times f of x over 2. So f of x over 2 equals one half f of x. So the nice thing is we still have this property and you can also check it is true for any integer here. So f of x over m equals one half f one over m f of x. Okay. So we have those nice properties. First of all, we know that for any integer, f of mx is m f of x. And we know for those properties, f of x over m, it's 1 over m f of x. In fact, one thing you can combine this to really get what's called q linearity. So f of m over mx, that becomes since this is an integer, f of 1 over mx, and by what we've shown, that becomes f m over m, f of x. In other words, this is linear over the rational numbers. And what does this imply in particular? In particular, this implies, if you start with a rational number, f of m over n, that becomes f of m over n times 1. This one is a rational number, it comes out. So it's m, n, m over n, f of 1. Now, let's call this one c. I noticed we, we didn't, by the way, so far we didn't assume anything on f. We didn't assume continuity yet. So what have we shown? We've shown that f of m over m equals a constant times m over m. So in other words, for every rational number x, f of x equals cx. So f basically is uh, cx but over rational numbers. You see, so f might look something like that. Again, where c could be 0, but um, in general, it doesn't mean f of x equals cx for every real c, but it does imply this is true if f is continuous. Namely, there's a nice fact, if you want, if f of x equals g of x for all x in rational numbers, and let's say f and g are continuous, or even f is continuous, um, f, g are continuous, then this implies f 
is a function g. So here in particular, now, if you want as our second step, if f is continuous, let g of x equals to cx, which is a continuous function, and therefore what do we get? Well, f equals g over all rational numbers, so we actually have f is identically equal to g. And therefore, if f is continuous, so even if we don't assume differentiability, we do get the only function that satisfies the property, it's con that's right. um, linear function. Now, the question is, is this true in general? And the cool thing is, the answer is no. So if f is not continuous, there are functions which satisfy f of x plus y equals f of x plus f of y, but which are not linear. So such that f of x is not equal to c times x. And those are crazy discontinuous. And um, here I'm going to be a little bit hand wavy because you need a bit of advanced linear algebra for that. But basically, here's a fact. Any number x, you can write this as follows. As some uh, rational multiple of square root of 2 plus other things. So, so again, where a is rational, and then b is something that's sort of linearly independent of square root of 2. And let me be a little bit more rigorous now. Essentially what you have, you consider the vector space of the real numbers over the rational numbers, so where your scalars are just rational, then this set, square root of 2, it's a linearly independent set over v, and then it turns out that uh, there's a fact, which I think I've done in a previous video, where any linearly independent set, you can extend it to a basis. So extend this to a basis, starting with square root of 2 and any other vectors of R. And what I'm saying is, if you have any real number, you can write this as a linear combo starting with square root of 2 and then some other, you know, the linear combo of the other vectors, more or less. Okay, so x is a square root of 2 plus b, and I'm defining f of x to be, basically, we, all I want is f of square root of 2 is 1, and then f of all the other basis vectors is zero. And this is completely legit because there's a theorem in linear algebra that says, given any basis, there is a unique linear transformation with prescribed numbers you know, uh, uh, on that basis. So there is, in fact, a linear transformation such that this is true, and in particular, f of x would be a square root of 2 plus b, and that becomes uh, a f of square root of 2 plus f of b. Yeah. That is legit because f is linear over the rational numbers. And we define square root of 2 to be f of square root of 2 to be 1. And so this is a plus 0, and that's a. So I define it like that. Whenever you can write x of this form, f of x is just a. And this is well defined because those are linearly independent, so they're unique such numbers. And I'm claiming that this weird f, again, the way you picture it is, this is square root of 2, it's 1 here, and kind of 0 at most other points. I'm claiming that f satisfies this, but f is not linear. And if you want, so, I mean, linearity, so, sorry, uh, additivity follows from the fact that f is a linear transformation, but if you're not convinced, let me show you why this is true. So suppose x is a square root of 2 plus b, and y, it's a prime square root of 2 plus b prime, 
then f of x plus y, that's f of a squared of 2 plus b plus a prime squared of 2 plus b prime, and that's f of a plus a prime squared of 2 plus b plus b prime. Again, how do we define it? f of x is whatever this coefficient is. That is, f of, that becomes a plus a prime. But what it is, it's f of a squared of 2 plus b plus f of a prime square root of 2 plus b prime. And that becomes f of x plus f of y. So in fact, this makes sense, okay? It is additive, and I'm just claiming it's not a linear function, and in fact, it's never linear, because notice, if f of x is any constant of x, then in particular, f of square root of 2x, it's c times square root of 2x, and that's square root of 2 times cx. But now, take x to be square root of 2, then we get f of square root of 2 times square root of 2 equals square root of 2 c times square root of 2. And then, that becomes f of 2, and that becomes 2c. Now, 2, you cannot write it as square root of 2 plus something unless that something is 0. And in particular, we have f of 2 is 0, so 2c is 0, so c is 0. Okay. But this is a contradiction because then f would be the 0 function, but we know f of square root of 2 is 1. So cannot be the 0 function, and that is our contradiction. Therefore. There are, you know, like non-trivial functions if you want that satisfy this. All right, I hope you like this. If you want to see more math, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.